Hello and uh, good afternoon, I should say. I'm Christopher Klonch, I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing over here at ITROI Solutions. And today we are privileged to have our featured speaker, founder and president, Federico Pena. He's going to be presenting on Zog Best Practices. And Fed is uniquely qualified to present um, on this particular tool for a couple of different reasons. One, he has been working with PPM, Clarity, Niku, and ABT, well, since he was a boy. And two, he is the chief architect and led the development of the tool for this effort. Um, and one of the things you know that I love about Federico is that he loves to give back. And uh, so we're having a series of these webinars to uh, assist in, in solving problems. Uh, this is actually the Zog Best Practices webinar UK style, and it's backed by popular demand. I had the privilege of traveling over to the CA PPM user group meeting in London a couple of weeks ago, and John and Paul over at CQC Solutions encouraged me to schedule a webinar that would work in a time zone that wouldn't get them up at 2 o'clock in the morning. For all of you in the UK, I met several of you at the user group and you had asked the same thing. So I said, Fed, what do you say? Um, Paul and uh, John have been kind enough to uh, co-sponsor the event with us. Let's get her scheduled. And it looks like we've had a tremendous um, response. Um, so very special thanks to uh, John Quinn and Paul Schofield from CQC Solutions and their team. Um, you know, they've been an extraordinary partner of ours for several years now, and I've really, in, um, really enjoyed working with them. And, of course, Paul, I want to also thank you for helping me to mine the gaff while I was over there. Those trains are complex. So before we uh, jump into the, the, the meat of the show today, I wanted to go through just a little bit of housekeeping, and this is pretty critical for this event by virtue of the fact that it's the questions and issues that arise from you, the, the, the listener, that, that help us to um, have the interaction to hopefully solve problems on the fly. Uh, those of you that happen to not be able to attend in the U.S. that have joined, don't worry, we're going to do this in English today. Um, this is a highly interactive session. Um, it's not going to be the typical PowerPoint that you sleep through during the course of your normal workday. So, if you expand the GoToWebinar panel, located on the right-hand side of your screen, down at the bottom there is a Questions tab you can expand. Please enter your questions there, or for the technically savvy, enter a question at hashtag CAZOG. The benefit of using the Twitter hashtag is that those questions and those conversations can continue long after the webinar has ended. Today we're going to have a couple of different sessions as, as far as Q&A goes. As Fed, Federico moves from topic to topic, we will stop and answer questions and address them as they come up. And uh, not to beat a dead horse, but I always do. This is an interactive forum, and we're here to help real users with real issues on their Zog. It is our hope that we can actually help somebody get through, or multiple people get through, some of their problems today. At the end, we will have a final Q&A session, and when we, if we, in the last one, we ran out of time, so. What we will do is we will get all of the questions answered, we will roll them up with the recording, we will shorten it and take, they'll probably cut me out like they always do, and uh, we will get the recording over to you so you can replay it. That will be available by, by tomorrow and we'll get it emailed out to everybody who registered. That being said, I think um, there's an important question on the screen and I would answer it. But instead, I think I'm going to turn it over to our technical expert today. Federico, you ready to go? Yeah, thanks, Christopher. Um, and I want to thank everybody for attending this 
this webinar. I think um, you know it's it's definitely the input from you guys that have um, that have brought us into making um, Zog or trying to make Zog more intuitive. Um, so Zog, in short, right, it stands for XML Open Gateway. Um, but it, really, what is it? Zog is just a web service call. Um, the web service call is wrapped in in a SOAP call. Okay, so it's a SOAP web service call. It is a little bit different than most web services, as it you know it tends not to follow all of the rules. Um, but you know, in in short, um, you know, you build XML files, you send XML files, you load XML data back into Clarity. Okay, um, so. As I mentioned, Zog is a SOAP call. The SOAP call is um, it's invoked through a URL. Usually, it's always invoked through a URL at a slash Niku slash Zog or slash Niku slash Wisdo call. Okay, and this basically brings us into the three different types of Zogs that you have. Okay, we have the invoke action. The invoke action allows you to invoke processes or invoke system actions into into the Clarity environment. Um, I have to admit, um, probably one of the least common uh, functionalities of Zog. I don't think I've ever used it myself. Um, I have seen it um, at a couple of client sites, but it's it's pretty rare. Um, then we have the Query API. The Query API allows you to extract data from Clarity, but much different than the Niku than the object read or the instance read. Um, the query API actually allows you to select what data that you want to read out by allowing you to read data directly from any NSQL that is inside of your Clarity environment. Okay? And then we have the object API. And the object API is probably the most commonly used, which is the one that, you know, you get with your Zog package when you download Zog and you get your XML files, you have a bunch of read files and a bunch of write files. So this allows you to read and write not only configuration data but instance data. Okay? And, and that's really what we're going to try and focus on today. Um, we will cover a little bit of the query API, but I'm going to focus a lot on the object API. So um, we've done, you know, I've done lots of migrations in Clarity specifically from um, from SQL to Oracle, um, where you're taking production systems, you know, that have, you know, tens of gigs of data, and we need to take that, we need to zog all of that data out and zog it back in. So there, I think, you know, coming across pitfalls, we've seen pretty much every single pitfall that there is, um, you know, and it's, it's pretty rare that we've come across something where um, we haven't actually encountered um, a workaround for it. You know, with this being said, you know, um, I'm going to go back to the basics of Zog saying, you know, it's just a soap call. Um, but like I always tell people, Zog is, um, Zog is like poker. It takes five minutes to learn but a lifetime to master, right? Because everyone can, um, can Zog something out um, and Zog it back in if it's a simple instance. But, you know, once you get into into objects or, you know, you get into data where you have um, relational data that's missing or, or you have an error that's causing your whole XML to crash, that's really where you need to learn all of the pitfalls of Zog or understand the concepts of how Zog works. Um, so I'm going to... Um, the topics that we're going to cover today, or I'm going to try and cover almost all of these, um, we're going to cover batching, batching Zog files. So what's the best practice of batching Zog files? Sometimes um, sending, sending one project at a time, or do you want to send 10 projects in one call, or 50 projects? And I'm going to talk about pros and cons of doing each. And I might get into a little bit into multi-threading. Um, you know, whether you send one thread, two threads, or multiple threads at the same time. Um, I'm going to spend a lot of time on XSLT, and, and the reason I'm going to spend a lot of time on XSLT is XSLT is something that um, a lot of people are unfamiliar with, um, but once you see the power and the ease of use of XSLT, you'll really, you'll really notice how XSLT can, 
can make your Zog life so much easier. Um, we'll get into you know how Zog expects dates, language codes, NLS settings. Um, the other one I'm going to spend a little bit of time with is auto numbering. Um, and then on the right hand side, I've got um, you know the complete equals true and the lead equals true, and those are just particular tags that allow you to perform different actions with inside of Zog that are outside of the norm of the way Zog normally works. Um, I'm going to get into time scale values in Zog. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm going to spend a few minutes covering the query API. Um, and the WSDL URL, we actually just covered it during the, the introduction, but I might, I might get a little bit more into it um, to explain how you can actually read the WSDL URL to get information that you may need. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up um, some XML files here so we can talk and discuss how XSLT actually works. Um, okay, um, I'm going to stop as well for a second here. Um, and I want to I wanna make sure that everyone um, is getting the most out of this webinar. And, you know, there's, there's no question that... Um, that we're not willing to humor to answer. So, you know, if you have a particular need or a particular problem that you need resolved, um, you know, just go ahead and ask the question. Um, we'll cover it. If we don't have time to cover it with inside of this webinar, we'll, um, we'll spend time um, after the webinar and we'll post the answers in our blog to make sure that you guys have um, the information that you need to, you know, to get you through that little hump that you may be having. Like I said, um, you know, there, there's nothing, there's nothing out there that is not is technically not doable. So, you know, if you're having a particular issue, just make sure that you you write it down, and uh, we'll help you out. All right. So I'm going to start. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have tried to have migrated objects in Clarity from Dev to Test to Prod, um, and it doesn't matter. You know, you pull out an object. And it doesn't matter what arguments you put when you extract the object, you're going to get something like this. And in this case here, you know, I've got a file that's 170,000 lines. But really, all the only configuration changes that you've done is maybe you created a few attributes. And you just want to move the attributes. You don't want to move anything else. But um, if we like, take a look at the XML file, this this XML file not only contains attributes, it contains views, it contains portlets, it contains queries, it contains just about everything and every other um, side object that's related to this one, as well as bringing everything back in multiple languages. So one of the, one of the main issues that we've had is um, when you zog out an object, um, you get Chinese or Japanese characters, and when you try and zog it back in, you know, you get you get an error you get an error because you get an invalid character set going back in. So in general, um, unless you are utilizing these characters and you need these particular characters because you know your Clarity is in Japanese or it is in Korean, but for most of us that utilize Clarity in English, um, I like to take all of this noise and strip it out. And I also like to get rid of all of the other noise and strip it out. So what do I do? I write an XSLT, um, and let me open up an XSLT file for that so I can... And... All right. So this is a basic XSLT file, okay? Um, and I'm going to look at the bottom piece, um, which is the important part, okay? Um, in this XSLT file, okay, basically what I say is, um, get rid of all the language codes that are not English. So it's basically going to take this, all of these, okay, and delete all of them except keep this one here, okay? And that's going to be for everything, for every object or every attribute. So it's going to look for the NLS description tag, and it's going to look for the language code EN, and anything that's not, that lands under that that's not EN, okay, it's going to delete it. So you can see that within with one line of code, I can now save you know hundreds of 
of lines of, of code with inside of an XML. And I do the same thing for everything else that I don't need, right? You know, I'm, like I said, I'm pulling out an attribute and I'm interested in attributes. I'm not interested in pages or portlets that are related to that attribute or processes that are related to that attribute or job definitions or queries or anything else that's going to come out of, of that particular object read because, you know, I'm, I want to I wanna try and limit the possibilities of me having errors when I load that data back in. So um, how do we transform um, this into something more legible using XSLT? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a little Zog tool that we have here. And I'm going to say I want to use XSLT transformation. Okay. So here it asks me for the XML, so I'm going to just paste the XML in here. And then I want to paste, I need to paste the XSLT. Hey, Fed. Uh, Federico? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. I know you're on a roll. Um, I, I'm answering the question for uh, Ashgar right now, but um, I think you might be able to assist a little bit. He's asking about whether he can get the slides later, which of course we will be sending them, yes, but um, and the recording as well. But he's saying that he can't read the screen, and I don't know if it's possible to make it larger because the XML and stuff is so small, but is it possible to do just a little bit larger resolution? Let's see, I think I think that that's possible. Hang on here. Um, I thought that would work. Control plus, no? Control shift plus. Um, <sighs> and also, Federico, the questions are coming in faster than they did in the last webinar, so be ready. All right. Um, I'm going to be... Uh, you know, I know that it can be done. If anyone knows how to make I, a screen larger, I think no if you hold questions. down, I think if you hold down the control key and scroll your mouse wheel, it will increase it. Oh, wow! Man. Look at you, John. <laughs> That's technical. <laughs> All right, I uh, I knew it was like that. I was trying control plus, but uh, um. <laughs> All right. So hopefully that's better. If not, um. You know, um. We'll, uh, we'll enlarge it in a sec. All right, so I entered the XML, I entered the XSLT, now I have the result. So let me just copy this and paste it in Notepad++ here so I can show you what the results look like, all right? And let me just, let's make this pretty here. All right, so we've taken a file that was 170,000 lines and we turned it into a file that's 2,300 lines. And all we really have in this file, okay, is we have our objects, our object, the NLS description in English only, okay, and our custom attributes. And that was all of the data that we actually wanted to bring. So, like I said, you can see how with with a basic with a basic XSLT file that really contains, you know, although, you know, half of these lines are comments, really with 20 lines of code, um, you, can, you can clean up your XML super, super quickly. So, um, you know, and we are going to be posting um, XSLT examples, um, and, and like I said, feel free to ask if you need something. Like I said, we've done just about everything, every type of, XSLT example um, out there, so you know, feel free. We'll you know, we'll gladly push it back to you. Um, but like I said, this this you're going to find to be your best friend going forward. Okay, um, and once you learn, you know, and, and XSLT is extremely common. Um, you can find examples on the web. You can Google it. You can uh, you can do whatever. I mean. There are even, you know, we, we utilize our own tool set for um, the XSLT transformation, but you can look online for XSLT transformation tool. There's lots of them. Um, uh, the problem with online tools, well, I'm not going to say the problem, but the limitation is um, online tools are not going to let you paste in 
um, a 10 meg file, which is usually what objects are, right? Um, so there are limitations to that. You want to just, um, so that's why a desktop application works best for Zog. Um, of course, if you wanted to do different type of XSLT transformation, which we might get into in a couple of minutes, um, then, it, you know, different, when I say different, I'm talking about instance code type transformation or so on, then that would be completely different. Um, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop now that I've covered XSLT a little bit. Um, I'm gonna stop and open up the ground for questions. Okay, Federico, um, the early bird gets the worm, so I'm gonna ask this question over here from Prakash Zanka. First, how do you auto submit or auto approve financial plans via a process or get the script? Any example you can send would be greatly appreciated. So we could send that via email, or you could answer it right here in the in the forum. Um, yeah, I mean, um, so Prakash, I'll um, I'll send you some type of examples of gel script. Um, we are going to have a gel scripting uh, webinar soon um, to cover some of that stuff. Because um, this is more going to be, although at the end of the day, that gel script is going to use Zog um, to auto approve. Um, but, but yeah, we can we can talk about that. I don't have a particular example of of the the approving uh, cost plans via Zog at the moment, but I can definitely send that to you. All right, Federico. Um, one of the things I'd like to know. This is from Marcos Garcia Mia. Is there any way for the Zog not to output all of the data, parenthetical documentation, views, lookups, etc.? We have had cases where not just one object is in the output XML, even when trying to read one custom object that w that they had tried to migrate. Um, These are great questions, by the way. Yeah, this is a fantastic question. So, um, as a matter of fact, yeah, there are arguments. I mean, I'm not going to say that they're perfect arguments, um, but I'm going to just, I'm going to answer with some arguments. All right, so there are arguments that you can put in the header section of your object read, okay? to limit the, the objects that come back. Um, obviously, if it's a sub-object of something, you know, you're, you have to get the parent object. Um, so that, that's really, okay, th that's really where XSLT comes in very handy, okay? And that's the way we do it. Um, we normally like to bring everything out, and then we write, you know, we have XSLT, and like I said, because we already have examples of everything. We have XSLT that just removes all of the noise. Um, because, uh, you know, a lot of the times, a lot of the times the problem is when you're zogging something back in and you bring out an object, um, the object contains all sorts of different items that are, that's referential integrity data um, to that object. For example, you can't really have, uh, create an attribute that's associated to a lookup if the lookup doesn't already exist. So that's why when you pull out an object, it pulls out all of that other noise because it doesn't know that that lookup is already there. Um, normally, the way we do it is, you know, we would pull out all the referential data first. We would push that in, and then we would, like I said, then we would trim that object read into into just attributes. Okay, and we would pull the objects first the attributes next, the views next. So everything really gets segregated, and if any piece of it fails, right, then you're really, you really know where to troubleshoot, and your whole migration isn't at risk because something's missing. Um, I hope that helps. I did provide some arguments that you can put in the header. Um, Thanks for that, Federico. Um, can you please provide some options and detail regarding Zog actuals to Clarity PPM? 
via maybe transaction object or timesheet object? Um, yeah, so both of, those, both of those are supported ways to get actuals into Clarity. Um, you know, so for transactions, you would just need the, the transaction write, and the same for the timesheet time sheet write. If you're looking for particular examples on, on a transaction XML or a timesheet XML, let me know if that's what you're looking for. We'll send you some. Um, although usually there's, um, and, and those are pretty standard. Um, you know, you can't really customize the transaction XML very much, so, uh, or the timesheet. So I can definitely get you those examples. But if you wanted to zog in actuals without using transactions or timesheets, that is also possible. Um, so there is there is a um, there is a tag in the project object called the act curve, um, and but for the act curve to work, you need to make sure that your project is set. A couple of settings are set. Um, one of them is the track mode has to be set to other, so it doesn't think that it's getting its actuals from timesheets, and um, your your track mode cannot be clarity. Okay, um, with with those items with those items, then yes, you can you can zog in um, tri actuals into clarity without the need of actually bringing in timesheets or transactions. Excellent. <clears throat> um, does the version in the header tag actually make a difference? We've used from version 8 to version 13 and seen no change in the way the data is moved or shown. Um, only if the version that's in your header is greater than your Clarity version. Meaning if you're on Clarity 13.1, and you try and push something with Clarity 13.2, it just it won't work. Um, but the other way around, you can you can have it as low as I mean, um, if you look, if if I turn around and I show you the first thing we do with our XSLT scripts is we uh, we switch it to version 12, right? That's the absolute first thing we do. And the reason we do that is because sometimes you're migrating and there's a a mild difference between the patches, so I just want to make sure that we bring it down to a version that's lower, um, so so we don't have any issues. Excellent, thank you. And that's how I always do it too, Fed. Um, you know, it, I, I was wondering when XL, S, XSLT was going to get into the question session. I'm just um, we have a great question from Adam Flanagan here, which. Um, I think will stimulate some discussion. Have you considered using re, um, rejects regular ex yeah, regular expressions in NP++ instead of the XSLT? Um, we have. Um, the thing is, regular expressions we found are not quite as flexible as XSLT. I mean, the whole purpose of XSLT and the reason it was written was to manipulate XML data. Um, and, you know, the, the, the problem I've always had with regular expressions is, you know, um, with, with, one sim with one simple character, I can, I can kill something and not know it. Um, XSLT, for, for me, is structured in a much easier way and makes manipulating the XML files much easier, right? I mean here, right, if I want to move, if I want to remove a whole node, I just say match that node and get rid of it, right? Um, you know, and the same thing if I want to, if I want to remove or replace uh, an attribute or anything, we found it much simpler. We have, we used to use before we got into XSLT, we used regular expressions and we used Perl as well to script the files. Um, as a matter of fact, we only got into XSLT, utilizing XSLT maybe a year and a half or two years ago. Um, but like I said, we dropped everything else once we found the power of XSLT. We found it um, substantially better and easier to use. But that, that is a, like I said, that's just a personal um, 
Federico, how do you exclude a parent object when reading? Um, all right, so so that goes back to the 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 arguments that I just sent to the question from Marco. So okay, and, I'm just, and basically you put these arguments inside of the header tag, right? So you say the arguments, the name is single content type, the value is object, okay? You make sure you have an argument called no dependencies, okay? And then a value that's called no parents. And, and that's what you do. Like I said, it, it does, um, it does work, but it's not perfect. Okay. Um, can we get um, the, can we, uh, can they get the API to Zog action items? Um, yes, so in Clarity 12.0, CA Global Delivery came out with a mobile application, um, and the purpose of the mobile application was to be able to manage uh, action items. Therefore, CA development had to build an API for action items. There is a limitation on action items, which is you can only zog in, zog out, or manipulate action items that are as associated to your user. Um, meaning it was designed strictly for a mobile app. You can't, you can't mass create action items for 30 different people. You can only create action items for yourself. You can only modify your own action items, and you can only uh, approve your own action items. So yes, but there's limitations. OK, OK. Um, what, I'm getting this question. What are you using for running the Zog? Um, it, a lot of people apparently are using the, um, I was going to call it the DOS prompt, <laughs> the command prompt at this point, and I, I guess we could put that out at a uh, hashtag CAZOG. Yeah, um, all right. Um, so we have, um, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this tool because I really wanted to, I don't want to focus a huge amount on it, but we have a tool um, called the ZOG and Query Bridge. Um, what this does is this allows you to do either single ZOG request or multiple ZOG requests. So the way it works is you put in your Clarity URL and you can manage, you can have lots of different URLs. So I'm going to put my password here. Um, you validate your username and your password and then you have, you have one of two options. Either you paste um, an XML file in here, so this is similar to the Zod client. Um, or you can do a bulk request, and you can say, well, I actually want to do a whole folder, for example. So you can come here, you can say, And I can click run, and it'll go through that folder and process each one of the files inside of that of that folder. Um, this is available for download um, on this website, zogbridge.itrosolutions.com. Um, so feel free; it's a free tool. Everyone's uh, everyone's allowed to use it. Um, you have a web-based version and a desktop version. And both contain the XSLT support as well. That answered another question, Federico. Thank you. And um, Mark, if you're listening, can you put that up in the Twitter feed? I got a question for that too, over there. Um, Fed, I got another question for you. Thank you for covering that. Um, okay, we're we're, we're going to go to the advanced class to auto numbers. Okay, how do you go about them? when they are not custom objects. I know for a fact that customs can be easily done with a few header settings, but in the idea slash projects, it doesn't seem to work 
the same way. Um, they've, they've actually had to use some um, procedures to get the ideas to match. Wow, what a question. <laughs> All right, so that you know, you're gonna you're um, you're gonna bring me into my next topic, which is auto numbering, um, and we're gonna discuss specifically that topic. All right. Um, so unfortunately, uh, it's a, it's a drag. It's a drag, but yeah, um, when they built the auto numbering for Zog, it's it, it works for some things and it doesn't work for other things. So uh, what? Ha what have we done in the past? Um, we've done exactly what you say. If you're on Oracle, okay, uh, it's super easy. You can write, you write a, what we do is we write a function, okay, that calls the auto numbering get next door procedure, okay, and in that particular function, um, all, all it does is it, we pass it in the parameters that we need um, for the auto numbering get next door procedure to work correctly. So let me just show you what that looks like here. Um, so like I said, we create a function. Why do we create a function? We create a function so we can actually query or use it inside of a query to get the data out. Okay. So um, in that particular function, we pass it the parameters that we need. And the parameters that we need are the object, the object uh, the attribute that we want to auto number, the partition code, um, and and then we give it um, we give it a, a row num parameter, right? So if if I need 50 or 100 different IDs, right? Then I say get me get me x number of records. So it's going to get you x number of IDs that you need. Um, and we have a little way to map it. Um, you know, we can definitely send you some examples on how to do that, but but really, there's th th there's no easy way. Um, there's no real easy way to do it. Um, you know, we used to we used to write a gel script and we used to query the auto num table. The problem with querying the auto number table is from the time that you get the number, the ID, and the time that you actually use it, somebody else could use it as well. So it's it's really highly recommended that you use you know, that you, if you're going to use the auto numbering from Clarity is that you use the store procedure. And the reason is it automatically bumps up the value for you before it gives it to you. Therefore, nobody else can actually get that number twice. Um, other options is um, that I've seen clients do is, you know, they utilize the auto numbering for creating in Clarity and they'll have another auto numbering scheme for zogging, and it's something that they store in a little database or a little Excel file, right? That they just keep adding to it. Not necessarily. Um, it's, it's pretty caveman style, but it does work. Um, you know, um, you know. I always tell people that you know, let's recommend CA fix that because it's, it's been you know since they implemented auto uh, auto numbering in Zog, which I think was version eight. Um, it, it worked for everything except for the main objects that we need inside of Clarity, which are the project and the idea object. So I never really understood that. Um, and, and I don't think it's it's been fixed. Maybe uh, go into the idea site and, and it, I think there's some notes on it. Maybe vote on a couple of those ideas and see if they get moved up so development can fix that. Um, okay. But like I said, we'll provide these examples on the auto numbering, right, on how to do how to write the function um, and how to write the end SQL and obviously you can use a regular SQL if you wanted to. Um, the reason we write end SQL is because we we utilize the query API if they're on demand or anything then we don't actually need to log into the database. We can just extract the data directly from the end SQL. Um, so just so you, so you know, Federico and Mark, um, I, I, in the answer section in there, I just put that was a long answer and I couldn't type that fast. So we'll get that updated for the replay. All right. <laughs> um, the, uh, but excellent question, great answer. Um, you know, as a, as a group of users, we can always help to encourage development changes by um, 
you know, submitting great ideas in the aggregate. Um, the um, Mark, there was a um, um, there was a post um, by a user in CA Communities um, about the Zog Bridge that Federico was talking about. Can you post that link in the hashtag? Over in Twitter and also in the um, in the answers here, so people can take a lead at it. And if you like what you read, go ahead and like it for us, because we always like our popularity. That was a um, do it right now. Uh, shameless plug, by the way. Thanks, Mark. Regarding the performance processes, Federico, in Clarity PPM that use X SLT, would you recommend them? We have seen a heavy impact on the run times of our processes that have custom scripts. Can you maybe just throw a few tips and tricks in on performance? Oh, what a loaded question. Um. <laughs> well, you know, like I always say, let's play stump the expert, right? You're the one who scheduled the uh, meeting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so th those are really gel-related questions. And, you know, I'm going to say, um, you know, and I, I really hate to say this, um, but you know, gel gel is great um, if it's written correctly. If it's not written correctly, it's it's just going to be it's going to be your worst nightmare. Um, so you know, I would uh, I would say, I, <laughs> boy, XSLT. Like I said, it, it's it's probably the fastest XML transformation and the easiest XML transformation that that it that exists out there. Um, but but to answer your question, I think what you need to do is you know reanalyze those particular processes in that gel script. Um, if you want to send me one of your gel scripts, I'll gladly take a look at it. And um, like I said I've, I've probably done tons and tons and tons of gel in the past, so um, you know I can definitely shed some some input into what could be causing it right um, something as simple as you know having the loops in the wrong place or something can really cause problems um, real quick um, I haven't heard much from Paul or or John I don't know if they they they, they wanted to, to have a have a say here I know we're getting close to the end of our session and any any opinions ideas mm -hmm. Uh, if anybody wants a memory stick with the Zog bridge on it, uh, we do have a, a few over here, so uh, we can send one out. Well, I appreciate that, Paul. Well, you left me with a load of them, so we might as well send them out. Well, I'll be coming back, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Thanks for that. Uh, those posts for the CA communities, uh, Rob uh, Essinger, I appreciate that. Let me see if here, Feta. Can I? Can we do a couple more questions? Is that okay? Yeah, we can do a couple of more. We can do a couple of more questions, and you know, uh, you know, I didn't. I actually didn't even get through only half of the agenda so far, or maybe even a quarter of it. Um, do you want to um, answer the questions that I have here, and I'll just put them in the question log, and maybe you can finish up the walking through the process, and then um, we'll we'll send out all the answers to the questions to the people who attended. How about okay. that? Yeah, yeah there's that. a couple. There's a couple of quick things I wanna I wanna cover. Um, I wanna I wanna cover the complete equals true and the delete equals true at least. Um, so I'm gonna start with the delete equals true. As everyone knows, Zog um, usually creates or updates uh, based on the ID of the particular instance that you're sending in or the object that you're sending in. But um, in some cases. Zog will allow you to delete. Um, so, it, although it's very poorly documented, um, there are some delete tags. Uh, we use delete tags um, mainly around project teams and as well as assignments. Okay, so you can delete assignments. You can delete team members from projects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide some examples of of how this works. So uh, the other one you can do is you can delete tasks directly from Clarity. So the way the tag looks 
is just like this. Make sure it's all in lower case. Okay. Um, it works for sub-objects of the project objects such as tasks, team members, assignments. Um, obviously note that the same rules of clarity apply, um, meaning you know you can't delete a task if it's got actuals against it or timesheets against it or so on, right? But real handy way if you know if you've made a mistake or you know if somebody has loaded a bunch of junk data or and you need to clean your environment up, um, definitely try this tag, okay? Um, you know, if you need to, it, unfortunately it doesn't work for custom objects, um, but, you know, if, if you need a way to delete custom objects, let me know. We've, um, we've got a couple of workarounds for that as well. So, um, try this tag, like I said, if you need to do cleanup with inside of your Clarity, try this tag first. Um, like I said, I don't, I unfortunately don't have documented what um, what objects are supported. I can only tell you the ones that we've used in the past, and we've had it to we've gotten it to work. Um, but we haven't tried every single object. So, um, like I said, very very handy. Um, the other one is the complete equals true. Okay, complete equals true is extremely handy extremely handy because um, in general, like I said, because Zog either creates or replaces, right, it really only appends data. So let's say I have a, um, I don't know, I have a, the most common ones for the complete equals true are for OBSs, um, security, rights, that kind of thing, right? If I have a user and in test, you know, we removed some rights from that particular user and I zog that user from test to production and I don't put the complete equals true, all it does is it takes the, any of the new rights and appends them to the existing rights. But really what you want to do is you want to take what's there and wipe out what's there and replace it with what you're sending, right? So that's where you actually have to put the complete equals true. Um, and I'm going to actually provide an example of an XSLT um, that allows you, that does that in flight for you. So let me just look it up here. No, it's not the right one here. Sorry, give me one second here. I think uh, I'm getting close to finding it here. That's not it. One sec, one sec. I'm getting close. I'm getting close. Sorry, guys. Um, all right. And and this is actually an example that that I will be sending to you guys. This contains all sorts of different examples. Um, and this is basically this is basically the code that you need for the complete equals true. So this will take this will take your XML if you're extracting a value. It'll take your XML and add complete equals true to your global rights, instance rights, um, instance OBS rights. Um, and obviously, if you needed to add more, you can just add more nodes to it. Um, and like I said, this is a great a great little example that does all sorts of different different things. Um, I know that we're going to be posting these, or these are already available on the web for you guys to download, um, you know, but it does, uh, you know, it does XML escaping of, of special characters, it, um, it gives you a way to actually, 
clear values within inside of Zog, which isn't something that I really talked about. Um, and, and I'm going to spend a couple of seconds actually doing that um, so you guys can really understand how that works. So, all right. So the way Zog works, like I said, is it creates or updates, right? Um, but let's say I want to wipe out a value inside of a cell inside of Zog. So I have a, a custom attribute. All right, I have a custom attribute inside of my XML, right? So if if I remove this tag from the XML, right, it just doesn't update it, it doesn't do anything, right? But if I want to wipe out the value, I need to send the tag, okay? But I need to send the tag empty, like this. This is how you're going to wipe out a value with inside of, of Zog. Um, all right, except there are exceptions. <laughs> Um, like everything else, and and this is um, this is where um, it's it's critical to to really get the, understand the pitfalls of Zod. So if if this doesn't work, if you can't wipe it out, you need to actually put no inside of it. Um, this is common, uh, for example, for dates, uh, resource hire, fire date, that kind of thing. Um, then um, then this is the way you would do it. So this is another way of wiping out. So if you wipe out uh, an attribute, you either need to put null or you need to send an empty string. Um, it's a little bit more finicky for MVLs, multi-valued lookups. Uh, multi-valued lookups are a little bit more complicated. Um, And let's see, I'm going to spend. You want to ask a question while you're, it, it, that you may be ask, answering this. Is there a kind of runbook for migration from SQL to Oracle making use of Zog? Thanks, um, Colin. I thought that was a binary question. <laughs> we do have one, um, except we utilize, I mean, every time we do that type of migration from SQL to Oracle, um, you know, uh, obviously, there's, there's, you can't just use Zog um, because there are things that need to be translated no matter what. Um, so you know, you have to make sure that you translate your end SQLs, your custom end SQLs, your gel scripts, all of that stuff. Um, we have one because we've done, I don't know, about eight or ten of those migrations, but we also have a proprietary tool called the Migration Bridge that really automates the way it extracts um, Zog files. Um, you know, if that's something that interests you, um, you know, we can definitely have a, a chat about it. But just just to give you a heads up, it's not a five-minute endeavor. Those, those migrations are pretty, pretty labor-intensive. Um, you just want to be aware, it's, it, you know, I, would, I wouldn't try and do it under less than three months. Um, and, and the problem is when you're doing it under, in, in that period of time, um, you have a, you know, it's not like you can shut down your clarity for three months. So you need to do it in a stepped approach and then you need to do deltas and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a fairly heavy process to, to do. Um, but yeah, you need to use not only Zog, like I said, you need some type of SQL transformation tool that's going to help, especially if you're heavy, heavy in end SQLs and heavy in, in gel processes. Right. I'm sorry, Fed, I kind of I, I knocked you off track there. Um, that's all right, Christopher. Um, I'm going to um, 
So there's a, another question. Can you zog out a query from Clarity? Yeah, you just use the query read. Um, let me see if I can find one for you here. Um, yeah, I'll send an example, uh, or if you like, I'll send an example of how you read queries. Um, but it, it's you just use the content pack, and it's it's called a, the tags, just a query tag, to be able to read queries standalone. I'm trying to I'm trying to see. It. If we're um, can you like caught up? We are. Um, we're caught up. Federico, we're getting, uh, yeah, we're, we're caught up on questions. It looks like I've got those few that I'm going to type in at the end, but um, we're getting up against the top of the hour, and um, I didn't know if you had finished or if we want to wrap up. And um, yeah, let's let's wrap up because otherwise I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll just keep talking forever and ever. Um, so the XSLT and script examples that we've used in this webinar are going to be available here. Um, there's also a download link is also available at the CA Twitter hashtag CA Zog. Okay, Fed, we got a um, we got an emergency question from Adam. You didn't make it to the query API section, but could you discuss the approach to the 10,000 node limit if return data? Um, that's a, I'm going to say that that's an application uh, restriction because it's not on the query API. So let's, I'm going to, I'm going to do this right now. So let's do, let's see. Nice so work, Adam. <laughs> code name from INV investments. Let's see how many I have here. All right, so this here, I'm using the query API. What this does is, uh, no, I only got 318 records. Where do I, uh, let's do um, ID from PRJ BLB slices. It's just got to have lots of records here. Um, so what I'm doing here is basically I, I write a query. This tool automatically generates and builds an NSQL for me and then spits out the results so I can export them to Excel. Um, so let's see. I just did a query. Um, and right here, I have 19,773 records. So let's just export this to Excel. And I'll just call it results. And where did I put that? Export to Excel. Did I call it results? Here we go. So you can see that right, we've got 19,000 records. So that's a limitation. That's that node limit is a limitation put by the application. I'm going to probably guess that you're on demand, um, but that particular limitation doesn't exist through the query API. As a matter of fact, we use the query API in our Excel interface. And uh, sometimes we need to pull back as many as 300 or 400,000 records, and we never have any problems. I hope that helps. Um, but feel free to send me a note. Um, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to put this contact me screen here. Um, send me an email. Send us an email. Send uh, support at ITROI Solutions an email, and we'll... Um, will help you with that particular question. 
Um, I know that we're already past the time. Um, just so you guys know, in April we're doing an integration best practices. So we're, we'll be discussing um, Zog and batching and multi-threading, which I promised I was going to talk about today, but we sort of ran out of time. Um, and then, um, you know, if you guys have any questions, right, we've got a team of people that, you know, will answer your questions. Just post them or put them in Twitter. We'll make sure that we get them back to you. Did, did you take me off the technical team, Ed? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Christopher. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, any closing comments over there at uh, CQC, or do you guys have to get out for afternoon tea? No, I don't, well, various <laughs> meetings is <laughs> afternoon tea with the Queen, you mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I think she's turned, out, turned down our offer as usual, so uh, we'll have to skip that one, I think. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, for um, what, what has been a fantastic um, interaction, and, I, and I'll have to say that in the... In the few years that we've been doing this, uh, the, the questions were just as good as I've ever seen. So we'll try to get those all answers, get this rolled up and get it sent out to you as soon as the technology will allow us to take out all my rambling. And um, we'll see you next time uh, for the, the integration best practices. Ed? Hey, thanks, everybody. I really appreciate your time. Um, I want to thank especially the guys from CQC for all of your support and making this uh, happen in the UK. I really appreciate yeah. everyone's time. Thanks. Yeah, Federico, thank you very much for uh, giving us a presentation for our, uh, for our mainly, uh, let's say, UK-based audience, but I know we've always had a worldwide uh, attendance, so that's been pretty good as well. Thank you very much.